So I'm Eric Say. I'm the owner and creative director of Game Day Creative. We're a uh, motion graphics creative agency. We specialize in broadcast graphics, sports, uh, game shows, television, all that good stuff. I'll play the demo reel. I think that'll give you a good idea of what we do. So yeah, lots of lots of sports, lots of TV, um, and that's actually what I wanted to talk about today. Something that's uh, super near and dear to my heart is uh, sports logo design, particularly 3D logos. Um, and also, I wanted to talk about Redshift, and hopefully, if we have time, we can get to a little bit of how you can make a living out of extruding logos. Um, but we'll see where we get to today, so we can dive into it. Um, so. I kind of wanted to take you through my process for designing a logo and you know some best practices and things to keep in mind and, and things to think about when making a 3D logo. Um, and with any design process, the first thing you do is sort of pull inspiration. You go online and you see where the, the status quo is of, of design, see what other people are up to. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, one, it's good to know what other designers are doing. Two, it's good to know design trends. Um, it helps you understand what your client's expecting, you know, what they're looking for when they describe their idea. Um, it can help you when you're designing to know if you're going to follow trends or try and subvert them. Um, yeah, so it's really good. But I thought for this, it might be fun to, instead of just looking at modern logos, to do just a little quick history of the 3D sports logo. So I got online, I did some research, and I found the original Monday Night Football logo from 1973. And look at that guy. That is the pinnacle of sports graphics. Uh, that probably wouldn't get approved if we, uh, if we put that out today. Um, and then in 1975, we got 3D type with textures. Yeah. Really, really moved along. Um, 1978, uh, we got some neon. And something I thought was actually kind of interesting about this one is I was, uh, I was on Behance, which is a great res resource for, uh, for, you know, seeing what other designers are up to, what people are making, and I was looking at sports logos, and I found this one. Neon lights still appear in sports graphics and play well. So maybe they were on to something with their, their, early, uh, their early iterations of, uh, of neon. Um, this is the 1987 Monday Night Football logo, and this one's actually really special to me because that's the year I was born. So that means that... 3D logos were being made before I was born, which is interesting. And also, it's not that different th than the logos we do now. So anyway, um, come around to 2000, starting to get shields. We got some stars in there. Stars have been a big staple of sports graphics ever since. Um, 2008. Now we're starting to get into some modern design. Um, I actually happen to know this one was made in C4D because it's up on the wall there, at least one iteration of it. This logo is pretty in line with modern design trends, although they have a, a more updated one. But one thing you can see that's going on here is lots of extrudes, right? Like, what, five layers of extrudes just on that face, a bunch of textures, some curvature, and it's really built out. And that was kind of a, a trend in sports logos, like over the 30 years, is just keep adding more extrudes and the logo gets, gets better. But then they took a little bit of a detour, and this is the 2019 logo, and they reduced the extrudes, and you know, they probably did this intentionally, and they probably looked at design trends, and they were like, you know what might be a good idea for sports graphics? Not more extrudes. Like Maybe we focus on design, but still high production quality, good textures, and a good logo. So it's a little just a history. 
but I did find some modern examples, and this would be the research I would actually do if I was going to start making a logo. Of, uh, and these are just some 3D sports logos that I really love, um, that I thought were really outstanding. Uh, this is the, the FIFA 2018, like beautiful patterns, um, great texturing, you know, the marble's great, tons of extrudes, some like really nice curves and shines, and hopefully I can show you guys how to make some of this and sort of get to this look. NBA Finals package, when this thing came out, it blew my mind. This is one of the best uh, sports motion graphics packages I've seen in a while. Check out that like, detailing on that, that 3D type, like the way they, they pulled that out and gave it dimensionality and all the rich textures, it just looks uh, really good. So that's how I love to start my process. You go through, you look at graphics. Oh, actually there was something on this one I wanted to talk about too. Love this package, it's the NFL Sunday Night Countdown package. It's a couple years old, but I think it holds up really well. But something I think is really interesting is there's a scratch right there. Like there's a scratch on the logo and that wouldn't have flown like now five years ago. That wouldn't have been something that but now with like production quality going up and the expectations from render, we want photo real and we want it to look lived in and, and yeah, we want it to look like a, yeah, a, cons a, yeah, a real world physical object and scratches are a part of that. So I think that's a, a cool example of that being incorporated. And actually this leads me to another point that's really interesting about 3D logos, particularly 3D sports logos, is we're allowed to take liberties with them as a designer. So. In all other logo applications, you get like a brand guidelines, and it's like, here's the type, here's the color, here's the background, don't change the type, don't change the color, don't change the background, but it's kind of like all bets are off when you get into 3D. And I think there's a couple things with that. One, um, a lot of trust is given to the designers, and I found when you go to convert someone's logo from flat art to 3D, they only really complain if it looks bad. So there is some trust there as long as it's executed well, but I think you also have to be true to the design, true to the, uh, you know, the intention of the logo and the typography that people set out to create. So I'll show you a couple of, uh, a couple of logos I've worked on recently. These are just style frames. So this is a, uh, you know, the Atlanta Falcons logo in there. You can see same thing going on. Lots of layers of extrude, some details, some textures. Um, this was done in, in Redshift C4D, and I'll show you the, the techniques to make this. We've got the Wheel of Fortune logo, you know, looking all glamorous. Game show, same thing, you know, extrudes, things to show sense of scale, all that jazz. Actually, one last quick point on the, I bet the, I bet in the future as AR and VR gets more popular, brand guidelines are going to come with, this is what our logo looks like in the real 3D world. Like, I bet the brand guidelines start to contain, like, here's how the extrudes need to be done. I bet that changes down the road, but for now, um, it's a really creative space, which I think is cool. I think that's uh, part of what makes it fun. So let's make a logo. So, I... took the liberty of designing a logo before I came here, and I think this is some of my best work. I think this is, this is one of the strongest logos I've ever made. Look at that. Look at how good that is. So, so, so legit. Um, so I just whipped this up in Illustrator, you know, classic, created outlines, um, no tricks there. So when I start making a logo, the very first thing I like to do is zero everything out and center up my scene, and that's just a good like workflow to keep it clean. And the single best feature in R21 is this PSR reset, position scale rotation reset. You click that and it snaps everything to zero and it's, it's everything you want it to be. So the first step for every good logo, you extrude it. Cool, so that's the logo. Thanks for having me, it's been really good. We can probably make this a little better. One thing that I think is really important with 3D design and making it realistic and um, just helping the production overall is a sense of scale. And I think one of the biggest giveaways that, that lets people know that something's CG, like it tips off their mind, like that looks fake, is inconsistent scaling. And there's a lot of things that go into 3D to make scale add up, like things like the width of your bevel, the sharpness of your shadows, the density of your textures. So one thing I like to do that kind of helps keep me honest on the scale is to drop this little figure in. And the default of this figure is like, the default height of a human, it's like a six foot tall figure. So like right now my logo is only several inches big and sports logos, they always want them big, right? Like they're going for this grand sense of scale. So I find when I have this to compare against, especially once I start getting texturing and lighting in, I'll flip this figure back on and off and I'll look at it and I can be like, okay, you know, this, this actually looks that, you know, the textures are scaled appropriately where it holds up to a human size. So let's go ahead and make this, uh, let's go ahead and make this guy big. So we'll turn him off, but uh, we'll come back to him later. Uh, turn down this a little thinner. So 
A big thing with these extrudes is adding the edging and beveling. And everything, um, if you guys were at the C4D Roadshow, Matthias touched on this, uh, everything in real life has a bevel. There's no such thing as this hard edge we see right here. Um, and the bevel does a couple things that are really helpful. One, it, of course, adds like a little bit of realism. Two, it picks up light. Let me just flip that on so we can look at what we're talking about here. Two, it picks up light. And three, it helps indicate scale. So your mind kind of has an idea of how, how strong a bevel is. And sort of like the mental default of the, the width of a bevel is about a millimeter. So like this desk here, or any flat piece of metal, that little rounding has an implied scale. So if the, the larger I make this rounding, the smaller the logo is going to look. So I want something fine, but I do want it a little bit stylized, because I want it to pick up the light. Um, and I think if I switch this to like you know, something with some shading, we can probably, um, yeah, you can see like just in the viewport, there's that little bit of a highlight running through it. And that helps. That adds you know those layers of detail. So the extrudes, of course, the first part, and actually, I'm going to do the wings separately with a little bit of a different technique. So I'm going to pull these guys out for now and just stow them. Uh, but we'll just work on this guy. So I'm going to connect all these splines into one object. And that makes them easier to sweep. So spline-based modeling and uh, sweep nerves are a really great way to build out dimensionality to logos and add some definition um, because they're super editable and you can iterate quickly. And I think that's a really important thing with design is the faster you can process ideas and, and you know, see that something isn't going to work, the sooner you can you know, move on to, to something else. So I think it's important to, to have a workflow that's you know, fast and, uh, and efficient. I'm going to change my view back so you can see really well. I also like spline-based modeling because you can add rounding very quickly and dial it in. I want something kind of thin here. Let's do half of that. Uh, and then I'm going to make this. Oops, thin, kind of wide, and slide that back. So one thing I was saying before with the, uh, you know, there's a lot of trust with 3D logos, and you sort of get to make your own interpretation of what you want to do. All your decisions with these splines and their shapes and things like that play into the, the flavor, the look, and the feel of the logo. So this logo, for whatever, and I didn't intend this when I built it, but in my mind, it looks like a flight school. Like those are like wings or, you know, like a pilot academy or something. And I think the aesthetic that would fit that is something that's sort of smooth and sleek and maybe, and maybe reflective. So the types of sweeps and, and bevels should complement that. Like, I think every decision you, should, you make should be done with purpose. And, you know, add your sweeps purposefully and, and play with them. If you just start layering up sweeps, they're going to get, it's going to get messy fast. And also, I like to keep these extra edgings uh, relatively thin, because if you start cranking these guys up, you really sort of betray the typography of the logo, and it changes the contour and the look. And you know, on a real logo, in theory, a, a typographer spent time on it and that you know, was lovingly crafted. And I think you have to do, you know, you have to respect their work. And, and, and so let's add some more sweeps and get these in here kind of quick. So I'm going to add some circle ones. And this will kind of lead into a, a larger point. Um, Circle rounding on logos works really good for a couple reasons. One, it picks up a lot of light, right? Like, as you start to roll lights around these and put your light rig around, you're going to get a ton of reflections, which are going to look really good. But in addition to that, it kind of helps break it out of looking 3D. The more, like, rounded surfaces, the, uh, the better the logo tends to look. Um, and I could noodle with the placements of these forever, but I suppose i got to keep moving. But that actually brings me to one, I think, huge design element with extruding 3D logos. And that's not just making 2.5D logos, which is kind of what I'd call what I'm doing right now. Yeah, it's 3D, but all I really did was like increase the thickness of it. I don't think it's like a truly a 3D logo. And I think I can, one, I'll show you some techniques to generate that. And two, I think I can show you uh, what I mean. So as first exposed this, I've, I've done some work with the NBC Sports Group on the Olympics. Huge shout out to them. They're the best designers in the world. Great people. Um, and they built this beautiful logo for the, uh, the Sochi Olympics. And I think this logo is a really good example of a true 3D logo. Um, so we built this transition kit for it. And I think I can play through this. Find a good moment. This is good. So you see how the edge of this isn't just flat to camera. It's curved. And there's a warm light over here that's casting warm light on this side of the logo. The panel has like definition. This contour picks up light. And the type has weight to it. Like it has a, a volume to it. Those are, 
I'm going to continue working. <laughs> um, I'll reboot later, Windows. And I think there's a really good close-up of that. Yeah, the mountains were modeled the same way. And you get that, like, look at the reflections. And this was done in the standard render. This wasn't you know, any third-party render. But those curves and those definitions are really what makes a 3D logo better than just a flat art logo. And that's, that's really the difference. So I'll show you guys some ways of doing that. But I think rounded sweeps are a good start to that. So I'm going to add one more here. I'm going to make this guy editable so you can see what I'm doing. Or go to point mode so you can see what I'm doing. And then take this circle. And I'm going to squish him, uh, scale him up, uh, scale up. Not what I wanted to scale up. Scale him up even more. And this is going to add just a big, I'm using this to add a big, bold, rounded edge to the, to the logo. Um, the width of this bothers me, but I don't think I have time to go in and start noodling with these things. Uh, so we'll just add this. But these rounded edges will go a long ways to picking up reflections. So, Cool. We got you know some rough extrudes, and if we were to light this up, these edgings would start to pick up color. Um, oh, there's one last one last tool I really want to show you that's really great for adding these extrudes in detail. And actually, I think I can show you in one of my references a really really cool example of this. So like in this NBA Finals package, right? There's like what one, two, three, four, five, six layers of extrudes. Also, multiple textures. So hot right now. So in with graphics. Uh, we got like metal, we got a pattern, we got some noise. But you see this little gold trim here that's accented on the outside? There's a really cool way of offsetting the stroke. And it's like a really super basic tool. But I, I didn't know about it till recently. So I feel like it's worth sharing. Solo this. And it's this uh, Create Outlines tool. And it allows you to shift the spline uh, you know, either inside or outside. So you could add contours in or out. So in this case, I'm going to add a little faceplate that's offset on the inside. And actually, I'm going to create new, because I, I want a new spline. All right, cool. Uh, all right, that's the new one. Sweet. So I'm going to extrude this one. Let's get out a solo here. Drag him forward. So I just want this to be a thin little, um, a thin little cap on my logo here. And I'll add a tiny little bevel. Oh, also. R21 has this awesome new rounding feature. If you haven't got into this, check it out. It's sweet. And this is a good thing with like when beveling a logo. So again, to me, this logo feels like a flight school. And let's just, let's just roll with that. But I don't think this four-step thing would work great for this logo. Like That's too industrial and, and too hard. I think the, the rounding has a better feel. So I think you know, be, be purposeful every part of your design. So I'm going to float this off just a little, because I think it'll be cool if there's like reflections behind there and maybe it cast a shadow or something. Um, so sweet. Uh, Offset type, really good. So let's look at how quick this project got messy. Let's clean this up a little. All right, cool. So let's check out these wing elements. And I think these wing elements are going to be, if, again, this was a, a flight school logo, I think it would be a huge disservice to just extrude these and to just be like, OK, cool, there's the wings. They need some dimensionality and a little bit of feel. So there's a few ways you can do that. And I'm going to say something that's going to be really terrifying to most of the artists here. I think I'm going to box model them. Now, there's a, procedural way, <laughs> there's a procedural way of doing it. And I'm going to do both so we can see kind of the strengths and weaknesses of each. Um, but they have different personalities. And I guess that sort of leads into a point like know the tools and know the results that each one's going to kick out, and then just pick the one that works best for the project. So I don't actually need this extrude. I'm not going to be doing that. Uh, we're going to make a cube. Let's see how fast I can box model. and. Uh, one thing that I think is uh, important to note on this, box modeling is not actually terrible, and it gives you some pretty good results. For what it's worth, box modeled, box modeled, it, it plays. Um, oh, no. All right. So let's crunch this guy down. And I also kind of want to show you this, because this particular box modeling technique has gotten me through a ton of build outs and works really well in logos. And uh, I just made a cube and I'm going to rotate it 45 degrees. Also, I'm almost certain, I mean, I don't actually know, but I'm almost certain this is the technique that was used to make this type um, and to make that face. Uh, this is sort of the, the approach. But anyway, uh, so let's position this guy, zoom in here. Uh, I'm going to make it editable and grab a face. So with a face selected in this orthographic view, you can just hold Control and drag it out. Uh, and this duplicates the face and starts to extrude it. So 
I'm going to match this to the curve, and I actually think this is sort of where box modeling beats procedural modeling for certain applications. As you can see, I'm not lining it up perfectly. And those imperfections, those little human touches, are going to add a little more rounding, a little more interest to the reflections, just a little bit more uh, production value. And that's sort of the appeal of box modeling is like that NFL where you add the scratches in. It's like adding a little bit of a, yeah, a, a natural human air. Um, so cool. That's probably that's probably good. Yeah, that's probably good. All right. Hop back over here. Grab the other side. Just extruding and scaling. Um, one thing that's important to to note on this is uh, as long as you're like doing it on the 3D view, it, it's going to scale or it's going to scale all the pieces evenly. But every now and then, I like catch myself and I'll, I'll scale it off. So it's probably worth coming back in and double checking in your perspective view that like the whole thing is getting scaled. That way it looks good um, on all levels. But I'm just going to try and fly through the rest, the, the rest of this real fast because this is not the most exciting thing in the world to watch. All right. One more to finish this up and we'll be good. OK. So to produce that result, uh, you know, we need to smooth this. There's not enough geometry. So we, we're dropping a hypernerve. So it's going to give us a weird result. It's going to make it a tube. So we need to add some subdivisions. Um, Cinema, a couple of releases ago, really cranked up their knife tool. And it's pretty cool. So if you hit K, it pulls up the knife tool. And you hit KL, it brings up the loop tool. And this cuts everything with a loop. Um, and if you start with a clean box, it's going to make really clean divisions. So I'm going to add some extra subdivisions here along the edges. And then I'm going to smooth it. So this shape might not look impressive, but let's get a texture on it, and I think it's going to start looking good. So one thing I want to get into, and hopefully I get the time for it, is Redshift. We made the switch. Um, I'm a huge fan of iterating quickly. Redshift is good at that, but I'm going to show you my like really basic light rig for standard render that gets you results pretty quickly. So I absolutely I start all my, all my projects with this light rig. It's the physical sky. You just go to July. You set it to the afternoon, flip on global illumination, and then just crush down these settings to the lowest, because you're not looking for quality. And what this does is it gives you like a really even baseline light rig. Maybe. It's just flat lighting. And I like to start with that, because then I know if I take my textures and I put them in night, they're going to behave well. I put them in daylight, they're going to behave well. It's just a really good way. Also, I throw a floor on here. It gives you some good shadows to work with. It, it's just a really, a really good like baseline light rig. And then my baseline material, and I pretty much made a career out of this material, is to take specular, crank it all the way up, drop the width so it's a pin light, so it's sharp, and then a reflection layer, any of them where I'll just use legacy, and use a, a Fresnel. And Fresnels are one of my favorite stylistic uh, shaders in C4D. If you're not familiar with a Fresnel, it's... Uh, it's fall off based on viewing angle. So the best example of it is if you were like at a, a pet store looking in the window, if you're standing straight in front of it, you could see into the glass. But if you were to walk up to the window and lay your head against it and look around along the glass, you would only see reflection. And as you straightened yourself back up, it would return. Um, and it's a really cool stylized look. So you can see it in the viewport here, right? Sharp reflection at the end, flat on the side. So let's, um, oh, and actually I want to I wanna make, I want to get this guy colored. There's a saying, blue gets approved. So our flight school logo is going to be blue. So now let's, oh, also the physical sky gives you a reflection map, which is nice. So for a baseline render, this you can kind of see what's going on with this box modeling. I love this fall off, right? We have like strong reflection here that gradients over, and then there's a little bit of a sharpness. Although I think, yeah, I actually want my specular to be like stronger. I want all that specular. Because I want that little highlight along that edge I made. Um, so I'll show you the procedural way of making this, which is very similar. But I think you'll get a good idea of the, the differences. So you could build this with a spline. would be a very quick way. So we're going to sketch a little spline. Oh, that is not the sketch tool. So super clean spline. So if you don't know about this, it's the spline smooth tool. And I actually don't know where the equivalent of this is in Illustrator, but this tool rocks. Like, look at that. Like, one click, and that thing is, that, that spline is perfect. Um, and we're going to sweep this guy out. And then we're going to throw a cube in there along that sweep. 
cool. Let's get back to our perspective. All right. And then we're going to tweak out this sweep. So if we go to details, we can add a little point here and scale down just the edges, which will taper the ends. And you know, you could probably line that up so it looks better. But in the interest of time, we're going to keep moving. Um, and then we're going to rotate this. Uh, so it's 45 degrees. And then we're going to add a little bit of rounding to this, uh, to this rectangle so it has that same sharp edge. And let's throw this material. So I feel like I'm kind of cheating my box modeling argument because I did a pretty poor job at whipping this up quickly. But I think we'll get the idea. And I, I think I can illustrate the point. So if we do a render, you can kind of tell that this sweep is flat on the top. Now, you could take that spline and finesse it. But I feel like the time you're going to take finessing that spline will just kind of be inherently built in with the, the box modeling. And I think the biggest thing with this is, again, like the, the really the, like, the golden achievement of 3D logos is, a true, uh, is to achieve a true 3D logo, is to add volume to it, to add it, to give it like weight and depth and, and space. Um, there's one challenge with that, actually, that I think this logo does really well. It still has to read well flat. Like it can have dimensionality, but it still has to, you, know, you still have to be able to render it flat to camera and have it hold up. But this looks a little less organic to me. Like the way that this specular is rolling across there, just exactly what I wanted. So anyway, kill this guy. Let's duplicate this real quick. And then we can hopefully get into Redshift and show you guys the power of that with these logos. Um, and actually, this is a reason why building in zero space, like zeroing everything out at the start, is very important. So well, not very important, but super efficient, is I can group all these. And then if I come up here and I uh, create a symmetry object and I drop my wing group in, I know it's just going to reflect appropriately because the symmetry is at 0. And it, and it just works how you want it to. Let's just give this a quick render. This actually reminds me of something else that I do want to talk about. I'll try and graze over it really quickly. So again, sense of scale is really important. And shadows play a huge part in sense of scale. So if this logo was the size of a skyscraper, the shadows would be sharp. Now, shadows have a feather on them, right? They blur at the edges, but not if you were far enough away to see a skyscraper's shadow. It would be a sharp shadow the whole time. So if you want to make a lot, an object look bigger, put sharper shadows on it. And I think I can illustrate that if I throw a, a different light on here with a, a soft shadow rig. That being said, area shadows just do a really good job because they're accurate and they just, look, they just look great. But it is a good way to sort of cheat it if you want to increase your size. So that's with a soft shadow, and that immediately just makes it look smaller. I mean, you know, apples to oranges on the light rig, but I think you get the idea. Uh, but sharp shadows, the scale of the bevel, and texture density is a huge one, so we can get into that. Um, so cool, we have a, a, a logo base, but let's, uh, let's, let's see if we can get this into Redshift. And let's see if we can get some light rigs there. So my, my go-to light rig in Redshift, my equivalent of the physical sky, is the dome light. Um, and it's just image-based lighting. It creates a sky dome. And I brought with me a, an old staple in the, uh, the CG industry, the old industrial hall. And this HDRI, I think, has been floating around for, for years. But it's, uh, it's a good one. Oh, actually, this kind of reminds me. I should talk a little, just a little bit about, I guess, Redshift. So we made the switch to Redshift uh, just a, a few months ago as a company. And it was, it, uh, I was a little intimidated to make the leap, and I found it pleasantly surprising at how easy it w was to use. It wasn't that difficult to learn, and it was definitely worth the time. Um, very happy with the results. Very happy with the workflow. Overall, super pleased. And I'm sure as like a lot of other artists, where it's like, ah, do I use Octane? Do I use Redshift? Do I, do I use Arnold? And uh, you know, Cinema went in on Redshift, and I'm hoping that they did more research than I did. So I'm going in on, I'm going in on Redshift, too. Um, so part of uh, the reason we had to shift to Redshift is we had a, a project where um, our client wanted photorealistic cars or very high-end rendering cars. I'll just Welcome to Hyundai's Sunday Night Kickoff. So it was, it's a, a car intro for Hyundai Sunday Night Kickoff. Same logo principles were applied. I mean, this logo, and actually I brought the C4D file with me. I can crack into it. But it's just extrudes layered out. Uh, we used a cloner to populate these little widgets along the same spline that was the logo. Um, but we had this project that we needed to get, you know, we needed to get renders like this. We needed our cars to look more realistic, to have this, this shine and this, um, you know, this polish. 
So we started shopping around, and then that, that led us to Redshift. Um, so we've got this loaded in. Fire up the Redshift render view. So just right off the bat, I'm going to turn this off. But you can kind of see it's lighting the scene fine. It's giving us sort of the same even lighting that the, the sky was doing. But where Redshift like really is going to really looks awesome is with the reflection. So let's get a material on here. Um, Redshift material. So if you're not familiar with Redshift, it uses node-based texturing, which was super intimidating for me at first. But I promise once you learn it, it's worth it, and you'll never want to go back. And it also wasn't super hard to learn. The, like, Tutorials are good. The, the internet is a, a fountain of information. So I'm going to whip up a material that works pretty well here. Um, I want it to be a chrome metal material. Metal materials don't typically have a diffuse. So I'm going to drop that out. Uh, GGX is a good simulation for metals. And the IOR is physically accurate for Nels is a good way of looking at it. And I'm just going to crank this. And you can kind of see over here, now we got this like sharp highlight. Um, this is a pretty good baseline metal. So check this out. I'm just going to throw, I actually don't know which one of these is the logo. I'm going to throw that on there. But got my symmetry in. Oh, I think there's probably still a lingering material. Yeah. Uh, but check that out. Like, that is basically 10 seconds of effort. And that does not look bad, right? There is some cool, there's some cool stuff going on there. Uh, I particularly like with this old industrial hall that light, like a little notch right there. That's why like image-based lighting is great. Like it adds a piece of detail into the reflection. But one thing that really really sells metals. A little bit of a blurry reflection. So let's just put a little bit of roughness on there. I think I went too far with the roughness. I think I blurred it out too far. Bring that back a little. Man, how do you work without dual monitors? This is murder. Um, <laughs> OK, so that's looking pretty good. I like the, uh, I like the roll off. Like, and look at how good the volume of that shape is. Like, that has 3D form. And look at how much light that's picking up compared to like the logo face. I'll try and show you guys a, a tip for doing the logo face, but there's a couple other things I want to touch on with texturing. But I can show you how to build out a logo face that has a little bit of dimensionality, too. So another thing I'm a huge fan of, and if you haven't used them, is substances. And they are incredible. Um, substances are prepackaged materials that come with the, like the bump maps included, the depth map, the height, not the depth map, the height map, uh, the normals, uh, the color channels, the diffuse, the reflectiveness. I personally use Substance Source. This is a, a library. There's tons of libraries out there like this. I've been very happy with these guys. And when I first like was looking at these, I was like, OK, well, there's no, uh, there's no way this is actually going to look like this when I get the material into C40. Like, there's no way it's actually that good. It is. Substances are incredible. And they're really easy to use. And they work in Redshift, and they work in standard render. They're, they're awesome. So if you're not using Substances, get on it. And they're native in, um, they come, uh, native in um, C4D now, the Substance Manager does. It's great. So I'm actually going to dock this. So sorry whoever has to come up here next, but I'm customizing this UI. Um, so sorry, under Extensions, there's the Substance Engine and then Substance Asset Manager. And this is where you load them. And actually, this is a huge, this is a pro tip. Um, the Substance Engine, by default, goes up to 2K. But if you want super high resolution substances, you have to switch the engine in the settings, although my Preference shortcut isn't taking. Uh-oh. OK, <laughs> give it a second. There we go. Uh, so if you come down to Substance Engine and you change this from SE3 to one of these DirectX, you can unlock up to 8K substances. Some substances are image-based, and some are procedural. Just depends on the substance. But if it's procedural, you can get you know, a really beautiful 8K substance. So I brought a substance with me. Um, uh, let's pull that in. Assets. And it's this bronze hexagon tile. No, that's fine. Um, so this is the substance manager. And the first, this is where the resolution is. So I'm going to turn it up. Uh, let's do a nice 2K texture. Um, and that's like, it pretty much just works out the bat. Um, press play on this guy. Cool. So it looks good, but clearly the scale is off. And I think some of that is like, we know how big a bevel is, right? And if these hexagons are beveled, that's, that's tiny and that's incorrect. So let's, uh, let's just tighten that up real quick. Oh, man, I just I talk about logos all day. This is another good pro tip. So I clicked on this face, and I wanted to edit it. 
And this is a really, uh, just a really cool shortcut that I recommend adding. It's called scroll to first active. I'm just going to dock that here. Sorry, I'll reset the UI when I'm done. But if you click this, it pulls you to whatever object you have selected in the manager. And if this was like buried in a null, it would uncollapse a null. But when you have thousands of elements and you just want a viewport select, this is a super quick way to get to your whatever you want to work on. Anyway, we'll tile that guy out. Oh. Let's do eight repetitions on each, something like that. And then let's see how that looks. OK, cool. So the density is about right um, as far as the repetitions. But it needs a little bit of lighting. And actually, I think, um, one, Redshift handles lights really well. Um, and two, I think this light is going to show off uh, some of the power of these substances really well as well. So let's just make, I, I really like area lights. Um, Redshift, again, does them really well. Well, that light is a little too strong. So let's turn this down quite a bit. And then let's get this at a more interesting perspective. So something I love is like there's a, a metalness pass. And I probably can't see it really well in here. Um, I'm going to scale this light down and make it a little weaker, Tim. Uh, inside of the substances. But over here, you can see it. So you see how all these hexagons aren't being lit up evenly? Like that variety is some really nice detail. And that's like what comes with those substances. They have these built-in layers of depth. And I think, that looks, I think that looks really nice. And already, we're starting to get some definition. So also, substances are highly editable. So I can make this blue to match the rest of our logo. Cool. And then there's one last thing with redshift texturing that I would love to show you. That's a cool. Um, I find a really uh, powerful way of getting good-looking materials, especially when you're, uh, when you're working with sports graphics. So open this up. And it is um, using image textures to affect uh, reflection roughness. And I just find it's one of those things that almost always looks good. Uh, so let's drag a, a texture node into here. I also brought a little grunge texture, pull him in. And I'm going to put this into a ramp. And I'll elaborate on that in just a second. And then I'm going to port this into reflections, reflection roughness. And then I'm going to come back here. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to make it a metal texture. So I'm going to kill the diffuse, crank the IOR, change it to GGX. And you can see roughness has this lock here. That means it's referencing something. Um, so I'm going to throw this on the floor. Redshift render view. Let's play this. So I guess you can kind of see it right off the bat. Like It's probably pretty visible right here by the L. There's a clear reflection, and then that reflection transitions into a blurry part. And that looks cool. That amount of variety looks like good detail. However, there are a couple problems with this. One, our mind knows how big a scratch is. And if that's the size of a scratch, once again, we made this logo look like a penny. So I would tile that out. Um, Actually, I think what I'd do is I'd paint a giant texture map that had tiny scratches, you know, like a 16K texture map. Um, for now, I'm just going to tile it. I also think tiling is kind of a dead giveaway that something's CG. And that's actually kind of, I, I like using image-based texturing better than procedural. I find it's, even with the most complicated noise patterns, it's very hard to make it not look like a noise pattern. Um, but for now, we'll tile it out. Um, cool. And then, and this I would like to do in real time. So let's see if I can find enough window space for it. So if I is adjust this ramp, like white is full blurriness, black is off. So as I, I tweak this in different directions, it's going to change this. And this is like the power of Redshift. This is pretty much real time. And if I'm correct, this computer just has one graphics card in it. If you have like a graphics card machine, you could turn this thing into a beast and throw all the lights at it and get almost real time results. Uh, I'm also going to just drop this off just a little bit off pure black so that we get kind of reflections across the whole board. But you can see how, like, one, you can change this on the fly. And two, it gives a pretty cool ground effect. A really good trick for making grounds look good is, like, cement tiles always have those little seams in between each piece. If I was, like, really going to build this industrial floor, which I've probably built a million of in my life, I'd put it in a cloner. Do I have time to show that? Probably not. But I'd put it in a cloner with a little bevel along the line so that there was like a nice little seam along it. Um, cool. Actually, 
Oh, there is one other thing that, that always looks good on. Um, I'm going to add one more material to this, and then I think we might have hit most of the meat of it. So one thing that's really big is like that neon look, right? Like um, emissive materials, things that um, uh, create illumination. Um, so Redshift has a material in it that's called the incandescent, and this is essentially an incandescent light bulb. The thing I don't like about this material is you can't overtune it. It comes with like a, it's capped at how bright you can make it. But if you use the default Redshift material, there's this emission weight. And you can turn this up to 100 if you wanted and make it really, really powerful. So I'm going to add, just on one of my sweeps, a light source here. So I probably overdid it with the light. So let's turn that down to 5. But I like that little contrast. I actually think that looks like it's kind of in the right flavor, right? There's a, a cool vein. But something that I think would be really cool is if the, uh, the light wasn't always on everywhere you saw it. It had a little bit more of a glass effect. Um, so there's a couple things you can do with that. One is add a coating, which is like a plastic cover. It's like, uh, what do you call it, polyurethane or uh, laminating? It's like laminating your material. So I'm going to turn that all the way on. And then also, I'm going to use my old friend, the Fresnel, but in the Redshift version. So under Utilities, the Fresnel is here. And again, Redshift works with like physically accurate render properties, this is a way of forcing it to stylize it. Um, so by default, the Fresnel is using index of refraction, which is this, the IOR, which is the physically accurate. So I'm going to turn that off. And if you set this to 2, that behaves exactly like the default Fresnel in the normal material shader. That was the first thing I figured out in Redshift. I was like, where is the Fresnel? How do I? Because I think it's a really powerful tool for stylizing. Um, and I'm going to plug this into. Um, the emission color. And I think I'm going to tweak this out a little. So let's do one color with like a bit of blue. Love blue. Good color. And then white's fine. So that's, that's got like a little bit of fall off and it's a little bit different, but I think I need to brighten it back up. Five. Um, and then if this, if this scene, if I was to kill all the light rigs, you know, this is a light source, so you could do that cool effect where like this rim flickers on and then the house lights come up. Um, and it will reflect off materials. But one other thing I really love is I think this would look pretty good with a glow on it. And this is another just huge power of Redshift is you can make uh, material-based render passes. And it's super easy to do. There's this output node on all your materials and there's this material ID here. So if I was to set this to one, you could go to, they're called AOVs, and this is multi-pass for those of you who aren't familiar. And then there's a puzzle mat. And drop this in. Material ID, um, I'm going to set all these to one. And that will kick out white in that channel. So now, and you do have to do a, if you, you can look at passes, but you have to do it with the bucket render. Um, it kicks out a pass for just that light. So I can pull that into the compositing program and throw a glow on there. And I really like doing multi-passes based off materials because that's how you're differentiating, differentiating stuff anyway. And I find myself in most scenes just kind of like pick whipping materials onto objects. So it's like a pretty intuitive way for me to add um, for me to add puzzle mats. I think that's everything I wanted to get through. Um, oh, do I have time to show how to extrude the logo face? Okay, okay. We'll, we'll show how to add a little bit of, a, a little bit of dimensionality to this, uh, to this logo face. Um, so I'm going to snag this guy. And I'm just going to do one letter for now. Uh, and this is a simple technique, but it actually works with most typefaces. However, it always creates that same sort of diamond logo. And there's a lot of ways of adding dimensionality to a type. You know, you could round it out. You could do the diamond logo, but this is just one way. Um, so let's just do the L. Uh, I'm going to duplicate this guy. And essentially, I'm going to offset the path again. Um, using, But the create outlines gives us a little bit of a wonky result. It's not even. So I'm just going to do it uh, manually real quick. Um, did I get two of these? Yeah, I sure did. I'm going to do it on an orthographic view to keep it nice and clean.
So another thing that's important, well, what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to use a loft to create a face out of this. And just kind of a best practices with lofts is to keep the same amount of points for each spline in the same order. You start to get twisting and they get a little confused. So it's really good to start with a thing, duplicate it, and then work out from there. Um, and they're right on top of each other. Oh, did I, I screwed something up. Well, I guess despite my best effort, so this is exactly what I was talking about. The points got twisted, but I think I know how to fix this pretty quickly. So let's just see. Kill this. So I believe if I set first point, that will fix it. Point order, set first point. OK, let's try that. No. Well, <laughs> rip. Uh, I'm going to try again. Let's try again real quick. I'm not actually sure what I misclicked. So before I uh, model this whole thing out, I'm just going to pull this over here in object mode and make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah, OK, that's good. Sweet. All right. And actually, I think this is going to be, so that's like a really crash course way of doing that. But I think one thing that's, that's really, uh, really cool about this um, is if I drop it into the render view and just compare like this letter to the others, it really is going to hammer home the, the dimensionality point. So actually, let's um, let's scrap this just so they're all on the same material. But look at how much more weight and reflection that letter has compared to his neighbors. It's just it's got more dimensionality and it's like a true 3D logo. Um, and you know, for an hour, it's not bad. Sure, it's not as good as the the logos we looked at. But you know, you throw six more layers of extrude and twelve more textures on this thing, and you got you guys got yourself a logo. So yeah, I think I think that's it for me. Yeah, thanks, guys.